Greetings from Freedom Mountain. It's Dr. Peg. So excited to be back uh, this week. Those of you that were with us last week, uh, you know that we had some major internet connection issues and Satan tried to stop the word. And so uh, as Brother Carl has al already told me many times that sometimes when it looks like um, you're not getting a connection, sometimes there's still a connection. And so I want to tell you that I went ahead and taught the entire lesson last week. And then when I was all done, then I called Pastor Tim and said, Hey, was it as bad as it seemed? And he said, Yeah, it was terrible. So we didn't put that on. There was only 17 minutes that was, that was recorded. And it was little bits here and there. And so... We decided that, you know what, this message is really important. And so we're going to give it to you again. So I just want to encourage you to get your notebook, get your pen. This lesson is an important lesson, and I don't want you to miss it. And so we're going to give it to you again this evening so that you can get everything that God fully intended for you to get. So this evening... If you have your Bibles, if you'll open up to 1 John chapter 2, that's where we're going to pick up. Need to let you know, we started a new series, uh, Thanksgiving Eve, and we're going to touch on that and just get you brought up to snuff on that. And then we're going to jump right into our lesson this evening. So as I said before, we began a new series. We're talking about the fellowship uh, with God, our fellowship, our personal fellowship, so that's what we did the first week, Christmas, I'm sorry, Thanksgiving Eve. And then last week, we were engaged in studying the hindrances to fellowship with God. Because the internet service was so poor, we're going to go back this evening. We're going to redo that so that if you missed it, you don't need to worry. It's here. It's going to be recorded. And you'll be able to go back and to get some more notes, even after the notes that you take this evening. So let's just take a moment and uh, bow our heads and just cover our time in prayer. And then we'll jump right into our lesson. So if you're gathering your Bible and your notebook and your pen, we're going to be taking a look at 1 John chapter 2 in just a few minutes right after we pray. So if you'll just bow your heads. Join with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message, as we know that it is a message for this time, for this season. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here this evening. We ask that you would have your way, and I fully commit to be the vessel, to be your oracle this evening. So have your way, Holy Spirit. Satan, we serve you notice. Step back. You have no authority here in Jesus' name. We plead the blood over this time that we have to study the word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are here and that you have a message and that we are open eyes, open ears with spirits that are receptive. And Heavenly Father, we thank you. We love you. We adore you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So we're going to pick up, do a quick review and we're going to get you back up to where we're at this week. The very first week, the night before uh, Thanksgiving, we studied 1 John chapter 1, the fellowship with God. And we talked about how sometimes we uh, kind of sway and we forget that our relationships with people and with God are more important than things. Sometimes we get consumed in... Um, that greediness, that cessation that we need to have things to make ourselves feel good, whatever that is, whatever causes that. For different people, it's different things. But we need to remember that our fellowship with God is the most important, is the key integral part in our walk in bringing others then into the flock. And so having said that, we want to remember that when John wrote this letter, his purpose was to encourage us and to bring us into fellowship with God, to bring us into recognizing that our fellowship with fellow believers is truly important and that it will stimulate our growth in our walk. 
so that we can be more sincere in our walk in Christ. And so, moving then to our lesson for this evening, which we studied last week, but we're going to present again due to internet uh, issues. We're looking at the hindrances to fellowship with God. And so we want to take a look and ask ourselves, why did John write this letter? So every time we read something, we find out the book, who wrote this? What cultural era was this? Who is he writing it to? What are their traditions? What are their thought patterns? What is their culture? And then we ask, what is the purpose? Why did John write this? John wrote this because he wanted us to be aware of our sin because he recognized that sin can be a hindrance to our fellowship with God. And if we continue in an habitual sin, it takes us further and further and further away. It divides us from God. And that would be a purpose of Satan, right? Because he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to destroy and to wreck your relationship with your heavenly father. Now, if you open your Bible to 1 John chapter 2, we're going to take a look at the very first, very first verse. Are you ready? My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. Now, notice that he says, my little children. Hmm. That you may not sin. So is he calling us a child? No, he's just referencing and saying, you know what? We used to all be at the very beginning of our walk. And so we were um, concerned about our sin then. We should be concerned about our sin now. And so we need to ask ourselves that passion that we had when we first got saved, when we saw all the wrong that we did and we saw the things that you know what, we're doing okay there, but these are the things that we need to lay down at the base of the, cr of the cross. Sometimes, as we walk through life, we pick up those things that are familiar, and we pick up habits that we used to have from way back. The old man creeps back in, and when the old man creeps back in, the new man diminishes, and the fellowship that we have with God is hindered and so he speaks to us in first john chapter 1 verse 8 and 9 in regards to sin and he speaks to us about con confessed sin and how important it is to confess our sin now most of you are probably mamas daddies grandmas and grandpas and most of you probably have had little sibling groups that get into a squabble you know, maybe one picks up a truck and throws it at another. And so then there's a lesson that has to be taught. And so we maybe put the little one on timeout. We check to make sure that the other is okay. And when timeout is over, we then begin to instruct that child in how to go and to seek forgiveness from the one that they offended or the one that they hurt. And so we never just say, Go tell them that you're sorry. Or maybe we do, but we shouldn't. We shouldn't. We should teach. What did you do? And have that child repeat back. I hit my brother with a truck. So when you go to say that you're sorry, you need to be specific. All right? Now, as adults, we might start off by saying, I did such and such, but... Or, I did such and such because, so we give these little clause or whatevers to try to, what, make ourselves feel better. Fact is, you still did something that you shouldn't have done. You obviously feel bad about it, but you don't feel bad about it enough to just simply say, I did thus and such, it was sin, and I feel horrible, and I repent, and I ask you, to forgive me I lay it at your feet and I receive your forgiveness and I receive your unconditional love so how many times have we watched a little person just walk up and say I'm sorry is that really is that how we should 
let that go? Is that okay for a child just, I'm sorry? That's attitude plus. That's pride. That's not a person who is coming and has recognized that they did something wrong with a genuine, please forgive me. When we approach the cross, the base of the cross, we need to have a heart that's repentant, meaning that we come, this is what we did. We're not proud of this, Heavenly Father. We admit that we did this. There may have been reasons that we did this, but regardless, it was wrong. And so we ask you for your forgiveness. And we ask that we would turn away in repentance, a 180, to not come back and to repeat that sin. So we stop and we think about a hindrance. A hindrance is something that uh, either Satan or you engage in that what? It melts your relationship or it floods out your relationship with the Heavenly Father. So I just want you to take a moment and say to yourself, Okay, is there anything in my life right now that when it's time to get up and to go to church and I understand that, you know what, we're in a pandemic and so sometimes the church doors can't be open for safety. I get that, okay? But I'm saying in a typical, is there anything that is a hindrance when I need to get up and to go to church, what self-talk do I go through? Do I tell myself that, you know what, I work till 2 or 3 in the morning and I just can't get myself up. So I'm just going to sleep in this morning. Is that what you tell yourself? Or could it be that, you know what, maybe I was out to 2 or 3 in the morning and, you know, I was just hanging, fellowshipping, partying. Maybe that would be the more appropriate word. Partying, and I didn't get in until 2 or 3 in the morning, and you know what? I'm just tuckered out, and I'm not going to get up, and I'm not going to go to church. Now let me ask you this. If that was work, would you get up and go? Yeah, you'd get up and go because you would be fired if you didn't go after a couple times. But because it's church, in your mind, you tell yourself it's not that important. They won't miss me. God won't care. But you know, while you're sleeping on that soft little pillow and you're all snuggled up in your blanket, you are missing something tremendous. And every time that you don't come to church, you just don't know what might be happening. Maybe you come to church and you don't expect anything. And if you don't come expecting something, well, then your relationship with God must be dead. Yeah, that's what I said. If you don't come to church expecting something, your relationship with God must be dead. Now, I want you to stop and think about that for a moment. When you come to church, do you come because you want to learn? Do you come because you want to fellowship do you come because you can't wait to worship and adore him you can't wait to be in his presence if your answer is no then i say that your passion is dead and we need to revive it your relationship with god has been altered you have put things before your relationship with god and so then you wonder why things are not going right in your life. And it would be because God's not first. Your relationship with God has to be first. You know that if you're a married person. You know that you have to invest in your relationship with your spouse. You can't just bumble through life and think that your relationship is going to remain just as good as it did the day you got married. Now, you can't possibly think that. So let me just say this to you. A relationship is a two-way thing, right? So you can't do all the talking. You got to do some listening. Can't do all the listening. You got to do some talking. You got to find some balance. You got to set aside some time to spend with God so that you can have a personal relationship and not just when you come to church, right? Not just when you come to church. That's great that you have fellowship with him then, but how about how about during the week? We don't want to be that once a week person, right? Because 
your relationship then is still very, very shallow. Very, very shallow. And so we have all of these hopes and dreams that, you know, when we are ancient, old, elderly would be a more appropriate word. You know, we all have our eyes set on someone that we admire. And we all want to be like that person where the word is just coming out of our pores. And just our few words makes an impact on a young person's life. But you know, they didn't just get like that. They didn't just crawl out of bed that morning and voila, there they are. Every day, every day, they got up, they spent time, they put God as their priority every day. For how many years, how many years, consistency, consistency, discipline. There's that ouchy word, that's that word nobody wants to hear, discipline. Maybe you need a little bit more discipline in your life, right? We don't want to hear that, but just going to give it to you straight. Maybe we need a little more discipline. Maybe we need to go before the cross and ask the Lord to give us insight, to give us revelation as to if our relationship with God seems as though it is stagnant. I assure you it's not his fault. It would be yours. So you need to find that out. What have you stopped doing? Have you stopped going into your prayer closet and spending time with him? Have you stopped journaling? Have you stopped getting in the word and studying the word? Have you stopped having fellowship with brothers and sisters in the Lord? What is it that you've stopped? Maybe you've never had a fervent relationship with him and it's time to have that. So maybe that's something that God will reveal to you this evening. So I want us to stop and to think about that relationship do we desire it or do we not and so this is something that I found that I want us to to realize how much God loves us and to know that yes we sin but we have an advocate we have a defender his name is Jesus and Jesus goes before the Heavenly Father and he asks for mercy and grace he was the ransom he paid with his life for your sin. For your sin. It was a costly thing. Now, let me read this to you because I found this to be very heart moving. It is as if we stand as the accused in the heavenly court before our righteous judge, God the Father. Our advocate stands up to answer the charges. He is completely guilty, Your Honor. In fact, he has even done worse than what he is accused of and now makes full and complete confession before you. The gavel slams and the judge asks, what should his sentence be? And our advocate answers, his sentence shall be death. He deserves the full wrath of this righteous court. All along, our accuser Satan is having a great fun heyday as this happens. We are guilty. We admit our guilt. We see our punishment. But then our advocate asks to approach the bench and as he draws close to the judge, he simply says, Dad, this one belongs to me. I paid his price. I took the wrath and the punishment from this court that he deserves. The gavel sounds again and the judge cries out, guilty as charged, penalty satisfied. Our accuser starts going crazy. Aren't you even going to put him on probation? No, the judge shouts. The penalty has been completely paid by my son. There is nothing to put him on probation for. And then the judge turns to our advocate and says, son, you said, this one belongs to you. I release him into your care. Case closed. Now, how hard is it to ask for forgiveness with that kind of love, with that kind of a defender, an advocate who already laid down his life, already laid down his life. Notice, Jesus was fully qualified, fully qualified to be our advocate, 
and our defender. And he was sinlessly perfected. He passed his heaven's bar exam. And he is qualified beyond all qualifications to represent you in heaven's court of law. And so he's paid, he's paid in full for your sin. Sin doesn't need to be a barrier between God and us. It doesn't need to be. If we accept what Jesus did on the cross and we accept by coming and being honest and laying down and laying down our heart motivation. You know, sometimes it's not about the sin so much that you committed. Sometimes the bigger issue is the motivation in your heart that caused you to do whatever it is that you did that you were so ashamed of. And so that would be a root, something that you want to examine and take before the Lord and ask him to give you revelation about that. If there is something in the past, maybe there's something happening in your life now that you need to put at the base of the cross. Let's take a look now at 1 John chapter 2. We're looking at verse 3 through 6 and we're going to look at the fruit of fellowship. Now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself ought so to walk just as he walked. So now by this we know that we know him. You've heard me say that I know that I know that I know. But the only way that I can say that is that I've studied the scripture. I've spent time in my prayer closet. I have a relationship and I know God personally. I know him and he knows me personally. And so when I say that, then there has to be evidence. There has to be fruit in my life. Because if I say that and there's no fruit, then you have the right to call me a liar. Isn't that what the scripture says? Mm -hmm. If we have fellowship with him, we automatically have a desire to keep his commandments. So our simple, loving obedience is a natural result of our fellowship with with God. And so let's stop and think about that when we say, I know him. You know, has someone ever walked up to you and said, Hey, do you know such and such? And I'll pause for a moment. And oftentimes I'll say, You know what? I've heard the name. I've heard the name, but I don't remember anything about that person. What was it that you wanted to tell me? Hopefully it's an edification of that person and not gossip. And then the person will go ahead and tell me. Or someone might, might walk up and say, do you know Pastor Tim? And I can say, yes, I know Pastor Tim. I know him personally. I have a relationship with him. There's been lots of time that I've spent in ministry with him. I know him. I know that I know. I know him. There's a history. There's a history. And so it's not an acquaintance where I could say I know of, just as we might say with God, do you know God? Or do you know of God? I can say, I know that I know that I know God because I've studied his scriptures. I've spent time in prayer, in conversation with him. And I've had experiences that are based on scripture. And I give testimony in my walk because I know him. I know him. And I can distinguish who he is I don't know about him. I know him. I have a relationship with him. And then the portion of scripture, but whoever keeps his word truly, the love of God is perfected in him. So perfection in the walk would mean matured, matured. And the only way, you know, we were talking a few minutes ago that we look at our elderly sisters and brothers and we so want to be like them. 
As we said before, they didn't get there overnight. It was a day by day by day by day discipline, obedience, obedience, and they persevered. And did they have days that maybe they disappointed themselves and maybe they disappointed God? Yes, I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. And yet, they didn't give up. The next day, they went back at it and consistently disciplined themselves to engage in their relationship. So, when we become a Christian, there's a change that takes place in our relationship with sin. A Christian no longer loves sin as he once did. A Christian no longer brags about his sin as he once did. A Christian no longer plans to sin as he once did. He no longer fondly remembers his sin as he once did. And he never fully enjoys his sin as he once did. And he no longer is comfortable in habitual sin as he once was. The portion of scripture that says to walk just as he walked. The only way that we're going to walk just as he walked is if we are abiding in him. Meaning that we are in fellowship with him and he's in fellowship with us. Meaning that we are studying the scriptures, reading the scriptures, consuming the scriptures, renewing our minds, renewing our spirits, and fellowshipping with our brothers and our sisters. So it's an everyday walk. It's not a one day out of seven. Stop and think with me. If you are doing the one day every day, you're doing a 365 plan. But if you're doing a one day out of a seven day, you're doing a 52 day plan. Now, who's going to get further in their walk? The 365 committed person or the 52 I think it's the 365. I personally signed up for the 365 plan. How about you? In verse 7, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him, and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going. But the darkness has blinded his eyes. And so the commandment that he writes is not new. It's not new. It's just that it's both old in the sense that it was preached to the brethren their whole Christian lives. But it's new in the sense that it was called the new commandment by Jesus in John chapter 13 verse 34. Again, that was John chapter 13, verse 34. You might want to check that out this week as you're studying. Dig a little deeper into that. So the new commandment to love that Jesus spoke of in that particular scripture was really new for several reasons. One of the most important reasons was that Jesus displayed a kind of love never seen before. A love we were to imitate. And so stop and ask yourself, if those around you were to describe you, would Christ's love emulating out of you be one of the first things that they would say? If not, you might want to reconsider and you might want to ask God to reflect on that with you. And so, here are the things that I want you to think about. Think of the cross. Okay, do you have a picture of the cross? Visualize it. The cross points in four directions to show that the love of Jesus is wide enough to include every human being, 
long enough to last through all of eternity and deep enough to reach the most guilty sinner and high enough to take us to heaven. This is a new love, a love that the world has never really seen before, the work of Jesus on the cross. Unconditional love. So just as our relationship to sin and our obedience is a measure of our fellowship with God, so also is our love of God's people. And so as I've said many, many times, God's love emulating out of your heart towards others should be one of the very first descriptions that others would give about your walk. And if not, there may be something that we need to take a look at. You go before the Father, and I'm sure the Father will reveal to you. In the portion of Scripture, But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness. Hmm. If we lose love for our brothers and sisters in Christ, then we've lost everything. You can do all the right things. You can doctrinally believe all the right truths. But if you don't lo love others, then you're lost. You're lost. So, let's just stop and think about it for a moment. We're not talking about a religion this evening. We're not talking about a religion. We're not talking about legalistic rules. We're talking about a relationship. Right? So a legalistic rela uh, religion will give you a, a bunch of rules. You got to wear this. You got to look like this. You got to be a woman. Got to be a man. Got to this. Got to that. Got to yacht, 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 yacht. And on they go and go and go. Right? But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a relationship where you have a Heavenly Father that loves you. That wants to spend time with you. He's not up there with a, a, a notebook telling. Screw up one, screw up two, screw up three, you're out. No, that's not the Heavenly Father I serve. I'm not, I'm not interested in religion. I'm interested in relationship. I want to have a relationship with my Heavenly Father. Not a religion. Not a religion. I'm not going to engage in a religion where I sign up for all my brothers and sisters around me to sit and judge me. That's not their job to judge me, nor is it my job to judge you. That's between you and your Heavenly Father. It's about your relationship, your relationship. Have you ever thought about the person that hates his brother? Maybe it's an individual who you never saw that before. You never saw that coming. And then maybe you saw that they were kind of low and they just kind of didn't seem themselves. And then all of a sudden they seemed as though they were indifferent, indifferent, as though they just don't care. They're just bumping along, bumping along, bumping along. They're too tired to rally for another's well-being. You know, the season that we're in is a really difficult season. So if you notice that there's somebody who is in despair or discouraged, reach out to them. Reach out to them and let them know that they're loved, that you care about them, that you're there to help them in any way that you can. All right? Sometimes you'll see that when we reach a time like this, if we've not built up our faith prior to the season, it's awfully difficult to be building your faith right now if you haven't been working on it consistently up to this season. And you've got to admit, even those of us that have been working, 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 there can be days, in all honesty, that you know what? It gets a little tough. It gets a little tough. But if we're seasoned, we know what to do. 
We know to get into the word. We know to call up sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so and say, Hey, I'm feeling a little low. Could you lift me up? Could you lift me up? Could you speak into my life? You know, could it be that there's a burnout? There's a burnout or there's a, you look at the things in front of you and you feel like there's no hope. There's no hope. No hope. Maybe because of that, you become stagnant in your devotional time. Maybe you feel as though it's a desert season and everything is just dried up. And maybe you need to reach out and let someone know. You know what? I'm in a desert season. I need you to throw some water on me. Just dump it on me. Pour it on me. Pull up the truck and dump the tank on me. I'm in a desert season. Maybe you've become oppressed in this season. Maybe you've become depressed. Maybe you recognize it, but you're trying to hide it. And you're trying to hang on for all it's worth. Because you're ashamed let me just say this to you. There's no reason to be ashamed. No reason to be ashamed. If that's where you're at, you need to call up your pastor. You need to call up um, your, your Bible teacher or your, call up me. Call up somebody and let them know, you know what? This is where I'm at. I really need you to pray. I really need you to pray for me. I need you to help me find my way and get me back on track. Let me just say this to you. God spoke to the little children. Forgiveness, when we first got saved, forgiveness was a joy. Wasn't it a joyful thing to think that all those horrible things that we may have done or said was covered in Christ's blood and that it was forgiven from the west to the east, just totally forgiven as though it never happened. Well, let me just say this to you. Forgiveness is God's gift. It's not man's achievement. Right? It's God's gift. It was freely given because he loves you. He adores you. It's not something that you can work for. It's not something that you can do 55,000 Hail Marys or whatever it is that you think you have to do. It's not your achievement. It's simply the fact that that it's your inheritance. It's your heavenly father. Relationally, he loves you. He wants to come and to embrace you. Notice in verse 13, 1 John chapter 2, he speaks to the fathers. Fathers, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. And so, when you're a father, hopefully you've had a relationship that's deep. It's a long spiritual standing. And so you know that your walk didn't come overnight. You've worked at it. And so the fathers are like that great big oak tree by the stream. You know which one I'm talking about. It's huge and it stands out amongst all the other trees in the forest around the stream. It's the oak tree. Those are the fathers. Those are the ones that have stuck with it day after day. They signed up for the 365 plan. They didn't take the 52. They didn't take the 52 plan. And so their spiritual maturity has been produced by the roots. Deep, deep roots. The depth of solid fellowship and relationship with Jesus. So I want you to stop and just ponder for a moment. Think about various relationships that you have. Maybe it's an acquaintance, which we mentioned earlier. I know the name, but I don't know the person. Maybe it's, um, I kind of know the person. I've met them a couple times, had a couple little kind of conversations, but I really don't know much about them. Or maybe it's, a, hey, I know that person. I meet with that person once a week and I've done it for 25 years. I've got a relationship with that person. I know that I know that person. Where is your relationship with God? Is it an acquaintance? I know about him. Is it 
I know a little about him because I've spent a little time with him? Is it I'm sold out and I know that I know him because I have fully invested in that relationship. I have spent time and I have an intimate relationship with him. And then notice in verse 13, the second part, I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. And so notice he spoke to the little children, then he spoke to the fathers, and now he's speaking to the young men. Now, the young men and the young women, they're the front line of God's work. Think about it. When we send uh, our warriors into battle, we don't send our children and we don't send our fathers. Who do we send? We send our 20 and 30 year olds, our young men, our young women, our young women, all right? And so they're engaged in battle with the wicked one, right? They've been trained, they've got the energy, they're at that proper strength, proper strength, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're an older father or you're an older mother, you're there to be a mentor, to feed in, to encourage, to be that support that's pushing them and seeing things in the spirit and protecting them. And if you're a child, then you're a child. It's time for you to learn and to grow. And one day soon, you'll be a young man or a young woman and you'll go out in the middle of the battle at the front lines. And so notice that he speaks and he repeats, he repeats, children, message to the father, and then a message to the young men, right? And we know that when he sets out a repetition, it's something that he wants to emphasize. So it's time to listen up, time to listen up. Now, I want to point out to you that John uses different words for little children in verses 12 and 13. He uses technia, T. E K N I A and Padia P A I D I A. Technia is more of an emphasis on a child's relationship of dependence on a parent. Let me repeat that so if you're taking notes. Technia is a more of an emphasis on a child's relationship of dependence on a parent. Well, pedia is more of an emphasis on a child's immaturity and need for instruction. All right, so two different words that he uses. All right, verse 14, he speaks to the fathers again, and he speaks to their experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ. Here's what he says. I have written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning so again, he is repetitively emphasizing this is a stage of spiritual growth which has been true and it's deep. It's like the oak tree. It's like the oak tree. All right. And then in 14, the second part of verse 14, he speaks to the young men, the young men, young men who are strong and no spiritual victory. I've written to you, young man, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. And again, repetition, emphasis. Notice that they've overcome the wicked one with the word of God. So they had to know the word of God. So if you're a father or a mother, if you've got a young one in that age group and they're not doing so well, could it be that maybe they weren't in the church when they needed to be? Or could it be that maybe you didn't put enough in? You didn't put enough in. So now when they're in battle in the prime of their life, they're not equipped. They're not equipped because you didn't take enough time to put in to their life, their spiritual life. So, so many times we think that their education is really important. And trust me as a teacher, it is very important. We think that they're emotional. We look at their dating and all of that good stuff, that social stuff. And yes, that is important. But their spiritual is the most important. Their spiritual is what's going to take them through life. That's what's going to get them from mountaintop 
to mountaintop. And when they slide into the valley, that's what's going to take them back up to the mountaintop. To the mountaintop. And that's what we want for them. So then we see that there's an attack on our relationship with godly, with God and uh, an attack on our godliness. And so we see that there is worldliness. And so we look at the problem of worldliness and we see this in verse 15. This is what he says to us. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So if we love the world, we're walking in darkness. We're claiming to have fellowship with God, but we're lying. And if we love the world, then we can't possibly love God. So I want us to really think about that. In um, Genesis chapter 11, if you have a moment, pop over there with me, and then we'll close. Okay, let's pop over to Genesis chapter 11. I just want to touch real quickly on the story of the Tower of Babel and the anti-God leader of humanity. At that time, his name was Nimrod. His name was Nimrod. Now notice, I called him an anti-God leader. Now I'm just going to throw this out. I'm going to throw this out. When I say anti-God leader, who comes to your spirit in modern day? Who comes to your spirit in modern day? In modern day, there's a Nimrod. There's a Nimrod in this country. There's a Nimrod. He's an anti-God leader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Stop and think for just a moment. All right? He organizes a rebellion against God. He organizes distrust of God's word and promises. And sometimes we're tricked by the eloquence, by the package. We're tricked. We're tricked. Or sometimes the package is not so nice. And so we make assumptions because of that. So we're looking at the outside package. We need to be looking at the spirit. We need to be looking at the fruit. Right? We need to take a look at the fruit. So I just want to encourage you to uh, look at this particular story with me. Because I think we can relate to this uh, in modern day. And so we're looking at the Tower of Babel. We're looking at Genesis chapter 11. We're going to look at the first nine verses. We're going to quickly do it. I don't want to keep you too long, but I think this is really important. Starting with verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass. And as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So now, there's one language. We know the very first language was Aramaic, right? They're in the land of Shinar. This is a term that we know it's also used for Babylon, for Babylon. And so notice that the people that are there under Nimrod, these are the people that came out of the ark, Noah's ark, right? These are the descendants of the ark. And they were told, um, they, they came together and they decided they were going to build a great city and a tower in rebellion to Genesis chapter 9 verse 1 where God said to them that they were to spread out over the earth. Now, why do you think they refused to do that? Do you think that was scary? Do you think maybe they didn't know, they didn't trust God that to know what was outside of the immediate area they could see? So was it fear? Was it fear that took over them? So notice that the kiln fired brick and asphalt construction this was a common thing in ancient Babylon and so let us make a name for ourselves now we have cities all over the world 
and there's been this kind of a competition to see which city can build the most unique and the tallest skyscraper. Now, is that something God told them to do? No, it's not. And so, I want you to stop and think about this. So, when they built this tower, they built it so that it would go up into the heavens, and they built it so that it was waterproof. All right? Waterproof. This was to protect man from a future flood. Because they didn't trust God, they didn't believe God when he said he would never send a worldwide flood again. So they distrust him, they don't believe him, and now they're rebelling. Now, minus these, remember, these are the descendants that came out of the ark. The eight people that came out of the ark that were the cream of the crop. And so now here we are, their descendants. Now, how does that happen? How does that happen? We see that happen over and over and over in the word. Looking at verse 5 through 9, and then we'll quit. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So they don't want to be scattered all over the face of the earth, but guess what? God scattered them anyway. So you know what? It pays to be obedient. It pays to be obedient. And so now they all speak 101 languages. That's just a number I picked for many, many languages, right? And so they're divided, and we're still divided. Still divided today. Of course, we have translators and whatnot, but still divided. And so the Lord scattered them abroad. It was a forced separation. And, uh, you know, they were divided linguistically and geographically. Hmm. Imagine. Disobedient. So they loved the world. So stop and think with me. What was the heart motivation? Pride. What else? They want to make a name for themselves. Disobedience. Rebellion. And rebellion. I can hear somebody saying rebellion. Witchcraft. Witchcraft. So we really need to think about that. When we say that we want to be engaged in the world and we want to get involved with things in the world, Maybe not so much. Maybe that's not a good thing. You know, stop and think. We don't have time to go into this, but stop and think about Lot. If you get a chance this week, study out Lot. Lot was looking for all of the right things visually for the right field. He stuck himself on the edge of, of the city. And the city, hmm, what a city, right? And you know that story. So stop and think about that. Stop and think about that. All right? You have to think for yourself. You can't just bump along and because somebody's in a position, say, oh, well, well, that's, that's who's in charge, and I'll just bump along. No. So here's the thing. You know, regardless of who is our president, we need to pray for our president. We need to pray for our president. But it doesn't mean that we don't have a mind of our own. So when we hear that our president is going to do, or our future president is going to do something that's unscriptural, hello, do we have any weepers and warriors and intercessors out there? Or are we just sitting there saying, oh, well, that's what he's going to do. Yep, that's going to happen. That's what he's going to do. Or are we praying 
Are we praying against and warring against that? If we're not, we should be. If we're not, we should be. And so I ask you, you know, don't sit there and be a couch potato. Don't settle in in your little complacency because we're kind of stuck in this season that we're in for now. You know, think about this. Some of you are not able to go out to work. You're doing your work at home. So then you have that hour that you would be driving to work. You've got an hour, an extra hour that you could be praying. You could be warring against. You could be the weeper, the warrior, the intercessor against those things that we see coming up ahead. Those unscriptural things that we see coming up ahead. Why do we just sit and act like we just have to take it? I don't think we have to sit and just take it. I think we can war in the heavenlies. We can intercede to stop those things that are ungodly, that are on the horizon. We need to take an active part, an active part in our relationship with God. And so I want to challenge you just to say to you, spend some time before the Lord this week. Evaluate your relationship. What are some things that are, that are good, that are feeding your relationship? And what are some things that you feel are hindering your relationship and making it so that your relationship is not all that it should be or all that you want it to be? And then once God reveals that, ask him how to, how to take care of that. And if you need to talk to somebody, make a call. Make a call and say, hey, I'm struggling in this. Can you help me? What do you think? What do you think? Or would you pray for me? Pray for me. All right? So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to come around your word. We thank you, Lord, that you give us instruction and you, you put characters in the word that have similar situations to what we're going through 2,000 years later. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that they're there as an example so that we can learn from their life. We can change our ways so that we don't have to go through all the bumps in the road some of them went through. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you care about us and that you love us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the price that your son paid for our sin. And we give you our, our gratitude, Heavenly Father. We ask you, Heavenly Father, that you would abide in us so that we might abide in you. We ask that you would draw us close during this season. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to place your wings of protection over each one of us. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to rain down prosperity of health and well-being and financial prosperity. Heavenly Father, this is a difficult season, a difficult season. And so, Heavenly Father, we completely rely on you, for we know that you are our supplier and that you take care of our every tiny need. And that there's nothing so little, so insignificant that you don't care. That we can't come to you and say, this is a need. This is a need that I have. Would you please supply? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We give you gratitude. We give you honor. We say to you that we love you, Lord. We love you and we enjoy spending time with you. And so I ask, Heavenly Father, that you would bless those that have come and joined us this evening, that you would bring them back yet another week to continue in our study. In your precious name we pray, amen. So I have to say goodbye, and I just say stay safe, stay well, and stay warm. And I'll see you again next week. God bless.